Good morning, everyone of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful for another opportunity. Uh, uh, for coming, I know that uh, we just shifted the brother. Um, that because uh, I might get engaged in the post today, just in case. But uh, I'm so thankful for the lessons that we have been learning in this place. I don't know about you, but I am personally being blessed. I am personally learning. I think that the Lord is helping me to grow in grace, in truth. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm also thankful for you people for coming together, that we might be able to study the word of God together. This is what God has been calling this church to do to spend time studying the word of God together, interacting together, sharing experiences, and above all things, praying together one to another. That's an amazing experience that um, prophecy has been looking forward to. And we are seeing it being fulfilled not only here, but in many parts of the world. And we are so thankful for God uh, trying to accomplish his work in us. Now, we've been studying about order, an uh, organization. We've been talking about work, how best to be able to work. And it was beautiful yesterday when we interacted about the qualifications of our work. And things were getting really uh, to a point where the rubber was meeting, the uh, uh, touching the ground and uh, the road rather, because uh, our lives were being scrutinized to see if we are fit to be called missionaries. If we are fit to be called workers of God, if we are fit to be used uh, in the field as representatives or ambassadors of God. And that's just amazing. Now, yesterday we were able to talk about confusion and we realized that God, our God, is not a God of confusion. And through that study, we were able to see that the God of heaven, whom we serve, as order. We were able to see order in the angelic host. We were able to see order in creation. That God didn't even begin by creating man. For what could man eat? What could he breathe? And so God understood that it was important to get land. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't know about that before until I, we were going through a lesson in, in the family Bible lesson with our little child, that, that God understood that without land there would be no spare place for trees to grow and man to, to live and all these things. And God said, Lord, let me divide this water so that it can go to its place and then let me leave the land aside so that man can be able to dwell on the land and trees can be able to grow there and all these things. And we see that the first principle we are seeing in the Bible of character development, the first principle and if you actually go to Sunlight, which is a beautiful book for those who are pursuing true education, the Sunlight program, you realize that the first character principle that is to be taught to the children is the character of order. How many of you have been able to see that in the Sunlight curriculum? The first character principles that they're saying that is revealed in the scripture is order. And so the first thing that the family should introduce in the life of a child is order. The child must be ordered. And that's the very thing that I'm seeing in the Christian church, that while it's in its infant stages, if order is not taught as a character principle to be developed, that that child, it will be difficult to straighten up when it grows. And so the child is told, oh, in fact, I remember lots of writings of Sister White, where she writes to Willie White, and she says that you should be so orderly, even in your room, to the extent that if light should go off, if there were blackout, you can be able to go into your room and spot exactly where you had your items. That's how much orderly she expected her son to be. Very orderly, but in, her, in his ordinary life. And I think that Ellen White was not proposing ideas that he herself did not, did, not, did not live out. And we realize that order begins at home. That when the home church is not orderly, 
then we can find our orderly church. We meet all chaotic church, church members, home churches combining together to form a local church which is chaotic. And when we move in that direction, we form a chaotic movement. And a chaotic movement cannot achieve God's designed plan. And so God was saying we need all. And we realize that Saturn is the great disorganizer. He is the great disorganizer. He's the one that causes disorganization from heaven. He causes the disorganization out of order. But God is a God of order and not a God of confusion. In fact, that is why we realized yesterday that God found a world, or rather he didn't find a world, but uh, God has no beginning. And we are told that the world was without form and the world was void, a chaotic world. And then the Bible says that God was able to bring order out of confusion. Because the world was full of water and the spirit of God was moving upon the waters and God said, I want the rivers to be where they need to be and rivers will never compete with oceans, never. And we realize that the trees are where they are. They never compete with animals. They never have all these things. They don't have that spirit. There is a lot of order in creation. And God, in the same day, or rather sixth day, God said, he beheld the world at the end of the creation. God said, it is very good. When order has already been restored in anything, God looks at it and says, this is very good. That's why we're reading statements where Lord God was saying that by this time that there was a perfect order. When that perfection has been obtained within us, a group, within the home, and, and you're like, all right, I'm going to speak about the, uh, <clears throat> the movement and everything. I want to speak about the home. Because the home is the ideal church. And then the home church is coming together. And that's why family life, very important. When the home churches come together, they form the local church. And the local church is coming together, they form the local conferences and all those things according to the gospel order. Realize, if that order is not in the home, then that order cannot be in the local church. God is a God of order. And having created so, he looked at the world and man, it was beautiful. No color clashing, beautiful color uh, uh, blending. Everything was doing what it's called to do. And then God says, hey, no, that's not enough. I'm going to show you what it means by order. And God speaks to Paul. And in the writings of Paul, guess what? Paul uses the body analogy. And we realized yesterday that while Paul uses the body analogy, Paul says that the hand cannot be the eye and the eye cannot be the hand. And the hand can say, I'm not going to do my work today. I'm going to do the work of the eye. No. Your two feet have order. And if you try to confuse that order, you're not going to move. You understand? <laughs> and yesterday, Pastor Alan Stubb was saying that attempt to tie your hand, your right hand there, and see how much you can accomplish during the day. Just try it. Just get your hand, right hand there through the whole day and see how much you can accomplish within a day. And you'll be able to see that you can accomplish very little within a day. In fact, in a, the little you are accomplishing in a very uncomfortable uh, uh, experience. So that's how important order works. So that's a beautiful, that's just to get us where we are with those of us who are coming uh, late yesterday. Um, so we want to continue <clears throat> with order into elements that God has introduced into his church. Now, there are many ordinances that God has introduced into his church. Some of the ordinances that I'm going to speak about right now is the ordinance of the Holy Communion and food washing. But there are ordinances like the ordinance of ordination that I'm sure we will be spoken about by another minister. We have the ordinance of <coughs> the ordinance of baptism, which is also going to be spoken about by another minister. Then we also have the ordinance of child dedication. Um, all these ordinances are church ordinances which are instituted in the New Testament gospel order. 
Remember, we are looking at the Bible as our creed, and we want to be able to study the Bible to know what God is saying. Because when we live outside the Bible, then we are living out of the truth, and therefore we are not following God's word. We are told that formality should be shunned. But in so doing, order should not be neglected. Let's not do the Holy Communion for formality. No, we are not meeting or gathering just for formality and doing the food washing for formality. But at the same time, we are told that order should never be neglected. Why? There is order in heaven. So, there was order in the church when Christ, after his departure, uh, rather you say there was order in the church when Christ was upon the earth, and after his departure, order was what? Strictly observed among his apostles. Strictly observed among his apostles. And then we are told, and now in these last days, while God is bringing his children into unity of what? Of faith. And we realize that that unity of faith is because we all are building upon one foundation, and that foundation is who? Jesus Christ, isn't it? Yesterday we read and we realized that we are all baptized into one body, and that one body is the body of who? Christ. And so, and now in these last days, while God is bringing his children into the unity of faith, there is a real more need of order than ever before. For as God unites his children, Satan, listen carefully, God, as God unites his angels, Satan and his evil angels are very busy to prevent this unity and even to do what? To destroy it. So that's something that we need to consider, friends. That is moving around like a roaring iron, seeking someone to devour. Right. All right, see what it says. Therefore, men are hurried into the field who lack what? Wisdom. This is what God is trying. Uh, we will continue contemplating. Men are hurried into the world. Men, go and preach, go and preach, go and preach. Men who have no experience at all. You understand? You remember, uh, and, and, and I like it because there's a time that I was in ministry with a lot of young people. He knows that very well. A lot of young people. And they hurry themselves of feeling every one of them who say, we are finishing the work. Wow. You're finishing the work. Everyone are going to finishing the work. You're finishing the work. We are finishing the work right now. Everywhere they go, they were, they were shouting back to people. They go to institutions and tell people, we are finishing the work. I hurried into the field. They had no experience. They knew not what trials were. You understand? And then it didn't take long. It didn't take long. God began to prove, to try, and to see if they were what? If they were going to finish the work. And soon many of them dropped. I, I, I'm sorry, some of them right now, they said we cannot, we have to go to Bukema and study theology. That's why God is saying, men are added into the field who lack what? Wisdom, and we are told in judgment, and perhaps not ruling well their own house. Did you hear Pastor Allen start to talk about this? Many of us, we have a pastor, David, pastor David, that many of us are in the field we cannot rule our own houses. Men who do not know what it means to bring up a godly world, family. A man beating his wife and sharing the pulpit with other God's people. You understand what I'm talking about? He insults his wife, he doesn't care about his wife, his children. In fact, I was listening today to Brother Eli Moody's uh, audio, and they were in, in, in fasting, I think they were saying that he that does not take care of his own house is worse than an infidel. There is a way Kiswahili put it that I've never heard about. Eh? How does Kiswahili put that thing? I heard it, but you know I'm not good at Kiswahili, so it just passed the other way. But it was so beautiful. And you need to read it. 
is worse than an infidel. You better be an apost uh, you better apostate than be an infidel. That our houses are the first churches that we've been given. And being able to manage our houses, bring them to Jesus Christ, then God can entrust you with this church, isn't it? Do you think when you come to leave the church, you might find an unruly church? If you cannot be able to manage your wife, who is not agreeing with you, how can you manage a church that wants to go this way? <laughs> you understand what you're talking about now? Then you come to the church and you say, okay, because you are saying you don't want to agree with me, well, that's split. Isn't it? I want to go my way. You cannot sit together and cancel, study the word of God together, visit with church members, do all that is needful, pray for church members because you've never learned it in the family cycles. You understand? Okay? All right, now let's continue reading what she says. She says, not only really where their own houses are not having order or governance over the few that God has given them charge over at the what? At home. Yet they feel capable of having charge over the flock of God. They make many wrong moves, and those acquainted with our faith judge all the messengers to be like this self set word. And it says, thus the cause of God is reproached and the truth is shunned by many unbelievers who would otherwise be candid and anxiously inquire at this thing so. So are they a blessing to the truth or a curse to the truth? They are a curse. And so you need to ask yourself, is your ministry a blessing or a curse? All right, let's go now to the real issue. The ordinance of baptism now I did this study last week, and you might have been privileged to have uh, seen it uh, in a meeting where we are. So I'm just going to go basically through the same study because I believe that this is an entirely new meeting. But the, the ordinances of baptism, and we are in um, 1691, the ordinances of what? Of baptism and what? The Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars. What are they? Two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. All right? So you're talking about monumental what? Pillars. And we are told, upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of a Trinity God. Of the true God. So when you're joining in the ordinance of baptism and in the ordinance of the Holy Communion, those are ordinances of the one true God and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. There are no ordinances of heathens. There are no ordinances of apostates. There are ordinances of those who have accepted that they are going to uh, surrender their allegiance to the Father and his Son. All right? Okay, so let's see the duties that God has given us. Duties are laid, duties have been laid down in God's word, the performance of which will keep the people of God humble and separate from the world. Now listen there. So <clears throat> we are talking about the duties that have been laid in the word of God that will keep the people of God humble and, and separate from the world. And from backsliding, isn't it? Okay, so like the nominal churches, so there is Humility, there's a backsliding and they separate from the world. From the world. So look at this. The washing of the feet and the partaking of the Lord's Supper should be more frequently practiced. So what is it that God has put in the church that helps the church to be separate from the world, that keeps the church from backsliding, and keeps the church humble? What is it that God has put? He has put these ordinances, duties, all right? We have a duty of baptism. You learn about it here. Sister White says that if this step is not made, then there are progresses that the Christian cannot make. Isn't it? All right? So that's why it's important. Okay. 
and washing our feet and partaking of the Lord's Supper should be more frequently practiced. Jesus set us an example and told us to do as he had done. I saw that his example should be exactly followed as possible. Mark those words. Because we just want to study the Bible. No writing over the creeds. Says, yet brethren and sisters have not always moved judiciously as they should in washing our feet and confusion has been cursed. And this was because um, men were washing women's feet and women were washing men's feet. But I, I know that as of now, we understand that men should wash only men's feet. Isn't it? Women can wash the feet of both. They can wash the feet of their fellow women. They can wash the feet of men. Isn't it? Because Jesus Christ's feet was washed by, uh, by Mary Magdalene. And we also told that, um, we also told that, uh, that, that verse says the women that wash your feet are I'm not sure, but first thing, isn't it? Chapter one was fine, huh? Yeah. But but basically that, that's 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 the order. But again, look at what Ellen White says as a caution that needs to be taken. It should be introduced into new places with carefulness and wisdom, all right? Especially where the people are not informed relative to the example and teaching of the Lord upon this point, and where they are prejudiced against if you are visiting with one of our friends down here, uh, uh, he lost his, his mother. And then he was sharing with me how a medical missionary went into an interior place and he, you know, maybe you have a small structure, you understand? And you are like, okay, I need to begin working. It's time, it's time to finish the work, to finish the work. And this guy was beginning to work and they began to do animals. And they were doing animals, you know, explaining to these people and then they began to get people into steam by those who said they are doing witchcraft sit there because they're getting you naked into a chamber and then they steam something or they get you undressed and then they, they use some fire. So you see, they didn't introduce that treatment with what? Wisdom. And so they had to be cleared out of that place by the government. Well, they say, but God is, I mean, God has brought us here, we are being persecuted and everything, but what did they lack? Wisdom of introduction of the treatment, you understand? They didn't understand that they needed to form the basis, explain these things to the people, educate the village. And so when they went there, they began doing the animals, they began doing this timber, and this was, everyone that comes goes through this regimen, these people don't understand anything, they say, we have seen this all. Oh, witchcraft and we've never experienced in the village. And then they were kicked out of the village. So we need to be very careful when we're introducing anything new. All right? Exactly. Say many honest souls through the influence of the former teachers in whom they had confidence are my prejudice against this plain duty and the subject should be introduced to them in a proper time. Did you see that? And man, you must know the time as a minister of introducing every message to individuals and to churches. All right? You must know how you want to develop. You can introduce a higher truth to a man who simply needs to get victory over alcohol fast. You're already teaching about true education. Isn't it? The man is sleeping on the gutters. That means you are not right with the timing of your word. He needs fast victory over that which is holding him in bondage. He's a culprit of alcoholic addiction, and he needs victory over liquor before you can be able to point him into further truths, such as where he should be in right. So let's see at certain elements that constituted the having of the only ordinance of the communion. It is borrowing every principles from the Lord's Son. And we realize that if you study chapter 13 of the book of John, 
and you also study chapter 26 of the book of Matthew, and you study 1 Corinthians 11, all these experiences you'll find Jesus Christ meeting with his disciples. Now, when Christ was meeting with his disciples, we realize that Christ himself told his disciples that now I know the time of the Last Supper is come. So go prepare me a place and prepare a meal that we may be able to congregate together and have a share. Now we are able to put a lot of principles there. For one, Jesus Christ has said to the Jerusalem church, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and they that are sent unto thee, how long shall I gather thee as a end gathered the but that was not from now henceforth your house is left unto you what? Jesus Christ separated from an apostate world apostate church and then those who are separated are the ones who gathered in the upper room a man's guest chamber and then prepared a holy communion now, the Holy Communion, someone asked, and I will not forget to mention, was prepared by those who are going to partake of it. Amen? Mm -hmm. It cannot be prepared by those who are not going to partake of it. It's not an ordinary food. It's not an ordinary or common meal. It cannot be prepared by anybody. The disciples who are going to be part, who had been ordained by Jesus, all right, are the ones who prepared the word. We are restoring gospel order. And if you look at the scriptures, those who prepare the ordinance, or rather the bread and the wine, must be men and women who believe the truth are in the faith. You can hire someone to prepare for you only from here. And it's not an either, not any of these people, but the apostles who had been ordained of God through Christ are the ones who are said to prepare the word, the ordinance. And so what happens in the church today? Are only those who are in the faith and who have been ordained? Ah. <clears throat> Ideally, should be able to officiate over the Holy Communion. All right, we'll be able to look at it a little bit more. But now, <clears throat> you are able to see <clears throat> that it's not a mass that the Holy Communion was to be held in the synagogue. For the synagogue, men had apostatized. So Christ chose a place, and that place became the church, isn't it? We'll be able to see that they were not single only taking the Holy Communion, but churches were meeting and rejoicing in the Holy Communion. Remember. We say, what fellowship are righteousness with unrighteousness? It's fellowship. All right. What communion are? What did what she do? That's the second. Uh, no, no, not Belial and Christ. Light and darkness. What communion as light and what? So communion and fellowship is not between unrighteousness and righteousness. It is and, uh, light and darkness. So we are basically told that in Exodus, when they were going to take the Passover meal, uh, in chapter 20, verse 43, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the world. There shall be no stranger eat their what? Yeah. How many strangers should eat all the Passover meal? Now, yes, and so we are talking about a communion service, which is so important for your spiritual growth. And God is saying that there is no stranger that is to partake of the Holy Communion. Okay, we'll be able to see that. In a little while, with more evidence, as it says, but every man's servant there is that is bought for money. When thou art circumcised him, then he shall eat thereof. So, if there was a stranger, then what was the token that he had to receive in order to partake of the Passover? He had to be circumcised. 
So there's something that must be done to people who come into our congregations and want to partake of the communion. Something must happen in their lives. And we'll find out what is that in today. And it says in verse 45, a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat there. In one hour shall it be eaten. You know how many houses? Thou shall not carry forth all out of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. There are principles you are going to take from the Passover to be able to explain for us the Holy Communion. While we totally agree that the Holy Communion is a different institution and it's not the Passover really. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be what? Circumcised. And let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Right? One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So let's look at the Lord's Supper. When the Savior yielded up his life in Calvary, the significance of the Passover forever did what? Cease. And the ordinance of the Lord's Supper was instituted a memorial, a memorial of the same event with the Passover had been attacked. But now we are seeing that the Passover was ideally a, a, a lesson of deliverance out of bondage, isn't it? So they were taking it to show that they had been delivered out of bondage. God was delivering them. So those who are actually going to partake of the Holy Communion must have been delivered out of something, isn't it? So those who have not been delivered out of something have no right to take partake of the Holy Communion. For the Holy Communion is to show the deliverance out of sin which Jesus Christ has wrought to us by his death on Calvary. Okay, let's continue to see. The Passover was ordained as a commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. God had directed that year by year, as the children should ask the meaning of the, of the ordinance, the history, should, this, the history should be repeated there. Thus, the wonderful deliverance was to be kept fresh in the minds of all. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper was given to, the, to commemorate the great deliverance wrought out as the results of the death of Christ, till he shall come the second time in power and glory. This ordinance is to be celebrated. It is the means by which his great work for us is to be kept fresh in our mind. What is the means by which we remember Christ's great work on our behalf? The ordinance of the Holy Communion. That's very important. It's very important. All right. So let's see what it meant to be a Jew. Bible says in 79, and God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant thereof, and thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. Verse 10 says, This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be what? Circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And verse 12 says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you every man, child, in your generation. He that is born in thy house, or born to marry a stranger who is not, uh, who is not of thy seed. Verse 13 says, He that is born in thy house, and he that is born with thy money, must need be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And then Titus says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, saved us by the washing of the regeneration. And then we are told, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Let me bring those ideas together. Ideally, for every Israelite, to every child of Abraham to become a, a Jew, he had to be circumcised. If born, he had to be circumcised in the eighth day. If born, he still would have to be circumcised. All their males had to be circumcised. 
and only those who are reckoned as true Israelites then by flesh. And that was important. Baptism symbolizes, or rather, uh, circumcision symbolizes baptism. All right? And so that's why Titus now is saying, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so what happens is, without baptism, we cannot become members of God's church. So let, let's see that a little bit. By the act of circumcision, they solemnly agreed to fulfill the conditions of the covenant made with Abraham. To be separate from all nations and to be perfect. How do we announce to the world that you are separate from all nations? By accepting baptism. Baptism is an ordinance that announces to the world our commitment to follow the Father and His Son. Our commitment to let the world be and choose Jesus Christ, our affections be on the things that are in heaven and other things of this world. If the descendants of Abraham had been kept separate from the other nations, they would, have, uh, they would not have been seduced into idolatry. Story of Redemption 147. But I look at this. So, how do we become members of the Church of God? Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance into the spiritual kingdom, isn't it? So, the sign of entrance into the spiritual kingdom is baptism, all right? And then we are told, he has made this a positive condition with which all must comply who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the most solemn renunciation of the world. Those who are baptized into the threefold name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, at the very entrance of their Christian life, declare publicly that they have become members of the royal ones. So it's a public declaration that we have become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. So we saw how people became Israelites, and yet so that no stranger was to partake of the past over. And now we are looking at how people become members of the royal kingdom, members of God's church, which is one body, isn't it? Because we read yesterday and we are told we are baptized into one body. And the head of that body is Jesus Christ. And, and, and we realize that that body is the body of Christ. And that Christ himself is not what? Divided, isn't it? So we are bringing all these truths together and we are really realizing that in order to be a member of Christ's body, what must be done to you? You must be baptized by immersion and that baptism is a sign of entrance to the spiritual kingdom of God and you become members of the royal family and children of the heavenly king. Now, only this group of people can join in a fellowship or in a communion. What does that mean? That means that no stranger, no man who has not partaken of this ordinance should join in that finish, isn't it? All right, <clears throat> let's continue. Uh, the supper is for those only who are fully church members, and it is several. Uh, uh, let me give you the, uh, the, the um, this is the signs of the times, August 6th, 1885 article. Uh, the article is the chart written by the editors. I think um, this was E.T. Jones and and and, and E.J. Wagon, the ones who are working at the Science of the Time. Look at what was written. This was a church official document published by the church. He says the supper is for who? Only those, only who are fully church members and it is celebrated repeated. Because there are men who are trying to suggest that the Passover should be only celebrated once, right? No. As often as is possible. All right. But yet we avoid the other end of fanaticism of making the Holy Communion a common word. They say as often as possible, let's just take it every two hours. 
or every meal time or every day it loses its meaning and there's a possibility of it becoming a formality and then we are told as the lord's supper belongs to the church members only it becomes important that we understand who are the church now this is where gospel order now comes up who are the members of the church because brother sammy was asking a good question how do you discipline someone who is not a church member? He can decide to marry a second wife. What do you do? He's independent. He judges himself. Isn't it? He judges himself. And then what comes out? Those people who say they believe in the one true God, look at their myth. But how is he our minister? You understand what I'm talking about? How is he our minister? It's because you don't have an organization. I told you experience of James White as they met women who were disagreeing in a flat, and while they were disagreeing, one was uh, insulting and talking like a worldly person, and they were like, these are the people who attend the Advent movement meet. And then James White says, now, how do we know those who are us and those who are not us? Then they say they are in need of organization. You understand? If anyone who believes in the messages that we believe in decides to misbehave, the entire movement is tainted with that sin. And yet the movement itself can do nothing. Reason being, the movement has no right to bring you and cancel with you. You get what I'm saying? So people can misbehave and do everything and no one will dare correct them. So that's why this editor is asking a beautiful question. How do we know those who are church members? How do we know those who are together with us, it says, or who are entitled to the privilege of the communion? How do you know? How do you know those who should say? If you don't believe that baptism is an important audience, then what about if someone comes from outside there and says, I want to partake of the Holy Communion? And you say, all right, you're not going to partake of it because you come from outside the world. He says, all right, but what about these other guys who are here? What makes you think that they're the ones who should be taking of the Communion? And then you don't have a standard by which to be able to uh, and that's why we are studying together. Amen? Mm -hmm. Many seem to support that whatever may be their church relations, or if they have no relations with any church, they are entitled to the privilege of the communion by virtue of their conformity to the rules and regulations laid down for the guidance of the church members. Against their claim, we enter our hearty word. Protest. So they are protesting. This is, this, is, this is the pioneer church. All right, let's continue. First Corinthians, we are told, and we need to understand this is something that we've read over and over again. We repeat it for us. The body is how many? One. And of many members, and all members of that one body, being many members, are one body, so is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into what? When we're taking the bread, the bread is a symbol of the body of Christ, we are all baptized into the body of what? So baptism is into the body of Christ. So those who have been baptized, they become part of the body of Christ. It's the only way of becoming part of the body of Christ that is visible. One of the monumental pillars that must be done, conducted also in the church. Say, Look at this. <clears throat> yeah. Uh -huh. Present Truth, Volume 1, uh, number 11, November 1850, 86 and 87. Listen to what it says. Then I was pointed back to the time that Jesus took his disciples away. How? Alone. Well, Jesus Christ took his disciples away. What? Was it an open communion? I need elders to, to understand. 
Now, if, 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 if you're looking for a present truth, I'm sure uh, Pastor Tom has the articles here. You could be able to get them and, and, and read them for yourself. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that, that, that's to help you if you don't get, because, because the present truth articles, you can find them in, 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 in that, that question. You know that? But Pastor Tom has those articles here, uh, the hard copies. See, <laughs> the fine time to go and prove these things. If they are so, and um, I will be good. <clears throat> so Jesus Christ took his disciples away alone, isn't it? Alone. So are we talking about open or closed communion? Closed communion. So when the Seventh-day Adventists began to introduce the open communion in about 1932, they began to introduce elements of open communion and says that everyone who was a believer, and a believer, you understand what they mean, was acceptable to partake of the word, of the Holy Communion. And that there was with the more body. And that is not what is being taught in the scriptures. Let's continue to see. He says, and you know, it's sad that they are claiming that it is the book, the Son of Ages, that changed things. Just the same thing they say with the truth about God. That our theology was changed by that little book, the Richard of Hades. That's the same thing they say about Holy Communion. Say, because of this statement in the book, and we read that statement, the Son of Ages, we think that Ellen White understood Holy Communion to be open rather than closed. But Jesus Christ took his disciples away alone into the upper room and first he did what? He washed their feet. The first thing, he washed their feet. And then he gave them to eat of the broken bread to represent the broken body and the juice of vine to represent his spilled blood. I saw that all should move understandingly and follow the example of Jesus in these things. And when attending these ordinances, should be as separate as possible from unbelievers. All right? We are, should be separate as possible from what? Unbelievers. All right. Let's continue reading. Let's read this beautiful uh, article, The Science of the Times, I guess the same article, 1885. Many charitably disposed brethren in the kindness of their heart consider themselves under the word. Under, uh, consider themselves under the obligation or to go to the communion of those who appear to be honest, pious people. Is it consistent to admit to the privileges of the church members those who have not been uh, have not the qualification to become church members, if you cannot fellowship with them as members, how can you how can you fellowship them not being? How can you fellowship them not being members? What it says, if you cannot accept them as church members, how can you accept them in the fellowship of the Holy Communion? You understand what I'm talking about? If you accept them in the Holy Communion, why don't you as well make them your church members and appoint them leaders in the church? You see where well, now the confusion begins. So we must be careful the decisions that we are making. All right, so they continue to say, Christ's example forbids exclusiveness, and this is the quote they use. They said this changed everything, but let's understand. Christ's example forbids exclusiveness of the Lord's server. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. So there is something that excludes people from communion. What is it? Open sin. When a sin has gone beyond you who has performed it, it is open sin. You get it? And if someone has done open sin, he should be excluded from the world. But how shall we do it without God? This is why now there's a lot of problems. He should be excluded from the, the, the Lord's Sabbath. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. 
This the Holy Spirit teaches how plainly. And then we are told, but beyond this, none are to pass judgment. That means for those who are in the faith, we are not to judge their hearts or motives. You understand? If we don't have any evidence of open sin, that they should be excluded from the world, from the Holy Communion. Now, this is not talking about those who are not members of the church. Ellen White is talking about the context of the members of the church. Reason being, she is talking about, she is writing about the Holy Communion where Christ took only those who believed in him. Isn't it? And then Christ, while taking only those who believed the apostles, he taught them a lesson for there was one who was planning to betray him. There were some who still loved the world, pride, position, all these things, isn't it? They were all here, but Christ didn't say, because I can be able to see that one of you will betray me, get out. Isn't it? So he was teaching them a lesson that they ought to learn, that you don't judge motives, you are not to judge the art because you don't have that power. But if someone commits open sin and is a member of the church, he should be excluded from the communion. But he should not be denied access to church services, isn't it? He should not be a representative of the people of God. You get what I'm talking about? God has not left it with men to say who shall present themselves on these occasions. For who can read the heart? This is a heart issue, all right? This is not an issue of open sin or apostasy. Who can distinguish the tears from it? Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Or whatsoever, whatsoever shall eat of that bread and drink of that cup and worthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, then we are told, he that eateth and drinketh, and what he eateth and drinketh to damnation. Uh, 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 eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That was the year 65. Now, she continues, when believers assembled to celebrate the ordinances, they are present to messengers unseen by human eyes. There are many, there may be a Judas in the company. And if so, messengers from the prince of darkness are there, for they are ten all who refuse to be controlled by the Holy One. But now you need to ask yourself a question. Was Judas an unbeliever? He was a believer. He confessed, except his heart was not converted. You understand? So there must be a confession. So when someone confesses that they, he confessed he was a disciple of Jesus Christ, he followed Jesus Christ, isn't it? There was no business with Jesus Christ to begin teaching the disciples that because he's planning to betray Jesus Christ, he should be kicked out. You understand? If a man has confessed with his lips, that he subscribes to the truths that the church is teaching. I have no right to begin looking into the heart of man, judging the man. But if there are open fruits that are being shown forth, then the church has the right to discipline. All right, but now let's continue because I, I want to spend more time there. Now, look at this beautiful book. Uh, I think it's the same, yeah, same article. She says, uh, they say, it is the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, not ours. And we have no right to exclude any who wish to come who profess to be the Lord's. Uh, yes, like Judas was not the one. He says, but that is the very reason why we should be very careful. Even exclusive. If it were our own table, we would admit many who we cannot admit. If the church were our own arrangement, we would accept many on the score of kindness, sympathy, favor, whom we cannot now accept. But it is indeed the Lord's church, the Lord's table, and as those to whom the truth and the ordinances are committed, we are truly bound to keep the church as what? Pure, 
as possible and admit to the Lord's table those only whom we would admit to the Lord's church. You understand? That is why there is a case where there is a man who had not been baptized, but he was invited into the Holy Communion. If, if you read from the spiritual prophecy, you know why? It's because he had already accepted or admitted to be the member of the church, and the church had accepted him to be the member of the world, and his baptism was already planned. You understand? But since the Holy Communion came before the time of the baptism, which was later that Sabbath, he partook of the Holy Communion. And that's interesting because the church instantly, you can take the Holy Communion on Sabbath. Yeah. That's it. There is no day he is ordained for the Holy Communion. There's nothing like it should be taken on Saturday or on Sunday only or on Tuesday only, or on Wednesday only, or on Thursday only, as often as is possible. All right? We are avoiding the two extremes of formalism and at the same time extremism. Let's continue. I saw Brother Watt. This is, this is uh, um, our... Um, This is 12 of Mark 247, brother. I saw that brother Bates erred again in praying for the sick before unbelievers. All right? And then you're told, I saw if any among us was sick and called for elders of the church to pray over them, we should follow the example of Jesus Christ. He went into an inner chamber and we should go into a room by ourselves, separate entirely from what? Unbelievers. And then the atmosphere would not be polluted by them. By faith, we could take hold on God and draw down the blessings. I saw that God's cause was dishonored and reproached in Western New York at the General Conference by praying for the sick in the midst of unbelievers. I also saw that Brother Bates erred in another thing in attending the washing of the saints' feet and the communion among unbelievers. And then she says, it only caused reproach to come on the cause of God. I saw that the example of Jesus should be followed. He took his disciples away alone, separate from the wicked, and first he washed their feet and then gave them to eat of the broken bread to represent his body and gave them to drink of that juice of the vine to represent his spilled blood. Brothers and sisters, that our communion is a closed communion is unquestionable. Only believers should partake of the Holy Communion. How do they become believers? Through the ordinance of what? Baptism. And we'll talk about then who should be able to conduct the baptism. How should it be done? Where are those cases exceptional? Where are they exceptional? That any other person who is sent as a missionary is allowed. The object of the Passover and the Lord's Supper. Um, the Jews had been strictly enjoined to celebrate the Passover. These had been instituted at the time of their deliverance from Egypt. Then the children of Israel ate the Passover Supper in a haste. Um, uh, this is review and held November 4th, 1903. I need a few portions of this. So I don't have time. Then the children of Israel ate the Passover supper in a haste with their loins girt, and then you are told, and with their staves in their hands and ready for their journey. The manner in which they celebrated the ordinance harmonized with their condition, for they had been thrust out of the land of Egypt and were about to begin a painful and difficult journey through the wilderness. But Jesus time, Christ's time, uh, time, but in Christ's time, this position had been changed. In harmony with the rest that had been given them, the people partook of the Passover in a reclining position by God's direction. Wine was drunk, but this was not fermented what? It was the pure juice of what? Of grace. 
All right? Let's begin to learn these principles that God is restoring us. If God is calling us to this, we must know what He's calling us to do. Pure grape, not ferment, not fermented grape. The Passover was ordained as a commemoration of the deliverance of children from the bondage of Egypt. God I directed when their children asked the meaning of the ordinance and read this, and they should not be able to repeat that. Just want to read something more. Reconciliation as an important object in these ordinances. Reconciliation one with another is the work for which the ordinance of the foot washing was instituted. All right? Differences among God's people, divisions, all these things are to be settled before we go to the altar to offer sacrifices. And we are told reconciliation is, is another work which is to be done by the ordinance of the foot washing. By the example of our Lord and Master, this humiliating ceremony has been made a sacred ordinance. Whenever it is celebrated, Christ is presented by his Holy Spirit. It is the spirit that brings conviction to the earth. As Christ celebrated this ordinance with his disciples, convictions came to the hearts of, of all, save that of Judas. So we shall be convicted as Jesus Christ speaks to our hearts. The fountains of the soul will be broken up. The mind will be energized and springing into activity and life will break down every disunion and what? Alienation. And then we are told sins that have been committed will appear with more distinctness than ever before. For the Holy Spirit will bring them to our remembrance. So the, these ordinances were spiritual. They were salvation. They had lessons we are memorizing. And so when we don't do them as formality, we begin to see how important they were. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to remember Jesus Christ. We may, by following the example of the Savior, be in a holy communion with what? With him. And in daily seeking to imitate the character, we might follow his example. So we might want to follow the examples of Jesus Christ in being in a daily communion with him. So it's not only uh, while we, we cannot eat the only communion every other day, we have to be in a daily communion with Christ. But should we forget this, the communion services are to remind us of that commitment, okay? Okay, so I want to <coughs> read something for us. As you receive the bread and wine symbolizing the broken body and the spilled blood, we in imagination in the scene of communion in the aperture. We are in imagination of the scene or join in the scene of communion in the upper chamber. We seem to be passing through the garden consecrated by agony of him who bore the sins of the world. We witness the struggle by which our reconciliation with God was obtained. Christ is set forth crucified among us. So that's an important ordinance that we don't want to miss out as a movement. I'm sure some of you <laughs> and so we are told that this ordinance of the Lord's Supper we are told it was to be till Christ shall come the second time in power and glory this ordinance is to be what celebrated it is the means by which the great work for us is to be kept fresh in our minds. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget Calvary. I'm just... Uh... Now, I just want to look at this in... Uh, about... 10 minutes and then we stop. The Lord suffered a full minute because <clears throat> this is really interesting. Now, let's begin looking at it. The act of the Holy Communion was combined, as was usual in the apostolic age, with a common need. And Paul now took some refreshment 
after the protracted labor of the evening, and then he continued his conversation until the dawning of the day. And then we are told it was time for the congregation to separate. So this is in 1894 <laughs> that they make this statement. But now we need to ask ourselves, what was their understanding of the Lord's Supper being joined together with a common meal in apostolic age? So we've studied from another, another script in, okay. He gets that right in January 1st, 1885. E.J. Wawana writes again, and he gets this right so that we might be able to understand how and how not. Our brother is mistaken in supposing that Adventists do not celebrate the Lord. So why was this brother saying Adventists you don't celebrate the Lord's Supper? Because the Adventists were not having the Lord's Supper as a common one. A common meal. So let's see what we we'll say. It says, <coughs> we judge, however, that he does not regard the ceremony which will serve as being really the Lord's Supper because it is not an ordinary regular meal. You understand now what he said? It's not an ordinary regular meal, but he says it was I mean, let, let me let me just go back there so that you see the difference. He says, as was usual in the apostolic age, with a common meal. With a, right? So that means the Holy Communion was a separate thing. And the meal was a separate thing. You see what I'm talking about? The meal is not what the Lord blessed and gave in commemoration. What I'm trying to say is Deni, Chapati, Gidei, that is not the Lord's Supper. You get what I'm talking about? The Lord's Supper is something separate. It's the bread and the wine. That is what God has constituted or instituted for commemoration of his death. Or rather of his, his body that was crucified and his blood that was spilled. He has not ordained all these green grams and all this soy milk and all these things. These are good foods, all right, but they're not part of the Holy Communion. You understand? The Holy Communion is the communion of the partaking of the bread and the word. Now, when you get into this a lot of movements, even here in our country, you find people messed up. Some churches involving children, some unbelievers, some, and it's because we don't spend time to study the word of God. And some are saying, no, no, let's just have a celebration with me. Everyone comes to church with a lot of food. You say, what, what's going on here? It's a holy communion. And now, uh, I want you to see, because we have to avoid this. Um, no, where are we? Uh, all right. It's not an ordinary or regular meal that the Lord's Supper celebrated by Adventists and Christian churches generally is identical in form with that instituted by our Lord and that to making it an ordinary meal is a perversion of the ordinary spirit. All right? And we are told can be easily demonstrated by the Bible to the satisfaction we think of our inquiring brother. One, our brother says, it is true that Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, does speak of a full meal in connection with the Lord's Supper, but only to condemn the practice. Okay, let's see. He does speak of a full meal in connection with the Lord's Supper, but only to condemn the sin. So we have to ask, why are you saying this, and? Saying that on the other side, we talked about avoiding the two one extremes yesterday. Now continue to see. In the first epistle, the apostle corrects many errors of the Corinthian church. After rebuking certain other unseeming practices, he takes up their manner of celebrating the Lord's Supper. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 21 and 20, when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's word, sir. 
For in eating everyone taken, taketh the before other is on one, and one is angry, and another is. That is to say, although you profess to celebrate the Lord's Supper, you do not take it in fact, because you eat and drink to satisfy the demands of appetite. So the Lord's Supper was not an institution to satisfy the flesh. It was an institution for the spiritual commemoration of Christ dying for us. All right? So the Lord's Supper was not having the objective of fulfilling what? The desires of the flesh. Oh, I'm hungry, so let's have a holy communion. You understand what I'm talking about? That's not it. The Lord's Supper had a special work that it ought to do. And that work was to help us commemorate the body of Jesus Christ by the bread and the blood which was spilled. Okay? Which is why the Bible says, as often as is what? This was. Then it says, <clears throat> No stronger evidence than these two verses is needed to show that those who partake of a full meal under the impression that they are celebrating the Lord's Supper are grievously mistaken. Why? In astonishment at their obtuseness, the apostle continues, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the house of God and shame them that have not? All right. You know what, what Paul is trying to say? Shame them that are. No. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then he says now, although the ordinance of the Lord's Supper was instituted on the night of the last Passover, let's, let's begin seeing another extremism that we can go into and think that in taking the Lord's Supper, we must follow all the laws of hell. Isn't it? Christ drank, took a liquid with a soul. No, we can't do it. So let's take a solid and wait for 30 minutes. Take a liquid, wait for 30 minutes, and take a one. They say, that, but that's the law of hell. Okay? Now let me show you another one. The Jews took their last meal at what time? By the weekly medical mission? That time between uh, noon, between a few hours after, after midday. Mm -hmm. A few hours. Actually, not beyond the three. But the Lord's Supper was instituted on the night of the last. You see what's happening here? Because the supper is not anything to do with the satisfaction of the flesh. The only communion was for a special commemoration of the what? The death of Jesus Christ. It was for sanctification. Of the body, and that's why I'm thankful, Brother Sam, you brought up an idea that the Lord's Supper could be done on Sabbath because do you need sanctification on Sabbath? Do you need sanctification on Sunday? Do you need sanctification on Friday? Any day that the Lord impresses on our hearts is a day when the Holy Communion can be partaken. That's why, in, in the spirit of prophecy, you'll find a lot of what interchanging days when the Lord, it was not taken one day, some were taken on Wednesday, some were taken on in the evening of Sabbath. In fact, in Battle Creek, they used to take it in the evening of Saturday, isn't it? Food washing or ordinances, most of the time, but not concerned. There are places where they took it in the morning before they, they, they went. So it's not actually set on some stone that it has to be there. The idea is, this was a special ordinance. It was not a common word. Me. You understand what I'm talking about? Then he says, uh, he says, uh, this apparent 
This is apparent from an examination of the records of the evangelist. Look, Matthew says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. Now, we don't want to take the other extreme of saying, no, 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 a, a, a people that take holy and believe communion and then maybe have a, a meal later are apostates. You understand? Now, we are looking at the two principles, avoiding the two extremes. And we are again saying that we are going to say that a people that chooses one day and prefers one day to another have apostatized. I get it. But the only danger is if we do it on one day, we are setting some precedent that is going to be after some time a tradition. You understand? Because what Catholicism did is on Sunday, they always had what? Feasts. All right? And the people began to love Sunday and say, we, we want to go there and have meal. Even unbelievers says, there is food. So what do we do? Let's go. Angry people say there's food. Let's do what? Let's go. So when we have it on one day after two generations, what do you think people are going to say? It is always that one. They might not have a Bible text, isn't it? But they will say, but that's what we've always been doing. But let me ask you people questions. How do you think you always do it after lunch in the nominal church? Because we found it being done. Isn't it? And so even if you chose me an elder today, what time do you think I will propose? After, after the summer. Do you think I can wake up one morning and say, no, 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 today we love it after the Bible is done. No! <laughs> you understand? Because they've already, they have already done it for time. All right? So that's the danger of, 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 of those two sides. And as we were eating, uh, Matthew says, John took bread and blessed it and break it on no, Jesus and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take it, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of this. This is my blood <clears throat> for the, of the New Testament, which is shared for the many of the remission of sin. And then you say, Mark's words are almost the same. Luke says the same. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, look at this. From this text, we learn one that it is not only the bread and the wine that commemorates, that it is only the bread and the wine that commemorates our Lord's word. It is not all the other foods that you cook, right? The Holy Communion is only the bread and the that commemorate the Lord's time. Then we are told that these emblems were partaken of after supper, i.e., after the Passover meal. Both these points are very clearly made by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, after he had shown the Corinthians what the Lord's Supper is not. All right? So he talks about what the Lord's Supper is not. Jesus Christ talks about what the Lord's Supper is. All right? So you understand what the Bible is not saying and what the Bible is saying. What it is not and what it is. All right? So that's important. <clears throat> and he says, we quote, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke that bread and said, Jack, this is my body, which is the bro broken for you. This do in remembrance of. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped after the eating of the evening meal, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Okay. This is too plain to be misunderstood. Paul did not depend upon hearsay for his evidence, but received a di a directly from the Lord himself. 
All that they were to do in remembrance of Christ as showing forth his death till he should come was to break and eat the bread and drink the cup of the memorial. And this memorial was instituted after the supper was over and was entirely distinct from it. The Lord's Supper consists simply in partaking of the bread and the wine, emblems of the broken body and the spilled blood of Jesus. Whatever more is added is a perversion of the ordinance. <clears throat> so that's simple as it should. If you add something that's a perversion of the ordinance, since the institution, whatever you do after that is not part of the Holy Communion, all right? The Holy Communion is just that which has been stated. Any other thing is not part of it. It says, since the institution of the memorial was entirely distinct from the Passover Supper, and had no reference to it, there is no more reason for having the celebration of the Lord's Supper preceded by a full or ordinary meal than there would be for introduction of it by the performance of some other act of Christ on that day. So what this means, let me break this down for you. If we insist that this must be done after this, then we make a rule or a law or another tradition. You understand? What we need to understand is we need to separate the Lord's Supper from the other things and say, this is the Lord's Supper. This is the Lord's Supper. What I do after the Lord's Supper is not part of the Lord's Supper. If one chooses to eat before the Lord's Supper, I just say, no, 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 everyone must not eat before, must, must eat before the world. They come for the Lord's Supper. They are going to say, no, no, we have to do it after the Lord's Supper. We have to eat. And the person say, all right, as you think, we protect it, and then we go to our homes. If we bind anything to the Lord's Supper and make it part of the Lord's Supper and continually repeat it, we make it a law. When we make it a law, a tradition. When we make it a tradition, there is a possibility that it will confuse even unbelievers. All right? And the believers will interpret what you are doing wrong. And that's what E.J. Wahona, they were trying to correct in the chat. And the declaration by Paul that eating of a meal is not the Lord's Supper should be sufficient to settle the matter. God bless us all.